Howdy folks, uh, hope you're all having a great weekend. I know it's early, I'm feeling incredibly rough this morning. Uh, welcome to everybody who's turned up in the audience for the live Discord Q&A for April. And if you're watching this as Mingles with Jingles on Monday, welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. So, um, I am feeling a bit rough this morning, uh, which is unusual because I did actually manage to sleep without the cats waking me up at five in the morning, demanding to be fed, but uh, I don't know, it's weird. You get plenty of sleep and you feel worse. Um, but we're going to crack straight on with the questions. Uh, the questions have been building up since Grumps opened up the uh, questions channel. And the first one comes from Gian Luck, or Gian, or you, you, whatever, Gian Luck. <laughs> he says, Morning, dear Overlord of the Soul Mines. I'm an early World of Tanks player that a few years ago switched to War Thunder. And I currently live in the year 2138, based on the early War Thunder videos. <laughs> His question is, I don't know if you heard about the narrator on World of Tank, uh, World War Thunder, sorry, videos, Bruce. Let's just say he was beloved by the community for his voice and narration, but due to declarations concerning current world events, was lifted from his role and went out stuck with a sterile narrator. Would you be so kind, dear Overlord, as to so much as to consider the possibility of taking that place or proposing for it? It would be an incredible thing to witness as a World of Tanks to War Thunder player. Let's piss off Wargaming even more. <laughs> Love an Italian guy, possibly armed with cheese if we ever meet. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know the name of the guy. Uh, or what he was known as, Bruce. But I do remember that the, he, his voice had a bit of character in those War Thunder promo videos. Uh, I didn't realise he'd been replaced. Unfortunately, um, that's kind of the world that we've been living in for quite some time now. If you have an opinion on anything, uh, and you work for a company, if they don't like your opinions, even though it's got nothing to do with the job that you do, you'll get fired. I mean, I suppose you can kind of understand it if he's the voice of War Thunder, and he starts talking about, oh, I don't, I'm don't assuming that we're talking about the war in Ukraine. He had an opinion on that and he got fired for it. Uh, the company doesn't want to be associated if you're in a particularly visible position with that company. I can kind of understand it. Uh, but as as far as me applying for the job, Gaijin don't know who I am. <laughs> I, I only do a War Thunder video once a year. Um, I mean, sure, it'd be a nice be nice work if I could get it, but I, 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 I can't see it ever happening. I'm a complete non-entity uh, in War Thunder these days. I mean, certainly in the beginning when War Thunder was just aircraft before they didn't introduce tanks or ships and all that, I was probably a big cheese in the War Thunder pond, but not anymore, and, and certainly not for a long time. Guardian have no idea who I am. There's no way I would be accepted. But speaking of, this is something that um, <clears throat> just before we started recording, um, Speaking of people who have an influence within a certain um, game, does anybody remember, because one of you guys actually uh, sent me an email about this, and, um, and I watched the link in the email and was absolutely horrified. Does anybody remember the uh, Earl Grey? Used to be a, well, used to be a World of Warships player, a community contributor. And then he got uh, a job working for Wargaming at the World of Warships studio. Um, and then he, well, did he get fired or, or was he forced to leave? He, he, he had a, 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 a rough relationship with Leicester Studios, the developers of World of Warships. He was working for them for a while and they wanted to get rid of him, but he hadn't actually done anything to breach the terms of his contract. So instead they just started making life really, 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 really difficult for him in an effort to get him to leave. And eventually he and Wargaming parted ways and then he popped back up on YouTube doing a, a video series called What's Up With Warships. Um, and then he kind of disappeared for a while, but then he popped back up again very, very recently. So one of you guys sent me a link to uh, a clip on YouTube of a Russian current affairs program where they had a couple of uh, British and American journalists that they were interviewing. And the British journalist, I'll use the word journalist in the broadest possible sense of the, t sense of the word here because technically you could call me a journalist because occasionally in Mingles for Jingles I talk about current events. Um, the British journalist, they'd filmed him going to a hospital in, I think, the Donbass area of Ukraine, in the Russian-occupied sector, um, delivering PlayStation 5s to, and I quote, victims of Ukrainian aggression in hospital, which is kind of bizarre because there is no access to the PlayStation network in Russia. I mean, you, you, can, you can use a PS5 in Russia, but you have to do a lot of illegal things in order to get it to work. 
Um, so this, this British journalist delivering PlayStations to victims of Ukrainian aggression was Earl Grey. <laughs> and I'm watching this propaganda program and I'm just thinking, Mike, because that's his name, you never go full retard. <laughs> and it was really surprising because I liked him. He was a nice guy. And I don't know what his circumstances are, but seriously, you never go full retard, Mike. So I don't know what they were paying him, but hopefully it was enough. Anyway, the next question. And I just actually, the thing that this guy's referring to, uh, this is the trash man, Physius. Thoughts on the Dutch guy firing his air rifle at the patrolling Apache gunship helicopter in the Netherlands. Yeah, I just saw that on Twitter. It was not an April Fool's joke. Um, so apparently uh, some Dutch guy with an air rifle took a pot shot at a low-flying Apache gunship. Now, I've never been that confident, right? Because I'm armed with an air rifle. It's an Apache gunship. I don't know what the hell. I mean, how, how under what circumstances would that ever seem like a good idea at the time? Um, somebody, he has been arrested. Uh, the story is just breaking. And I was looking at the Twitter. Um, unfortunately, a lot, was, a lot of it was in Dutch. But what, I mean, how... How, how much do you need to drink in order to think it's a good idea to start, start taking shots with... Even, yeah, it was an air rifle, but the Apache crew didn't know it was an air rifle. How much do you have to drink to think that is ever going to be a good idea? So check that out on Twitter, because I'm sure the story is going to continue to develop. I mean, I don't know what kind of idiot this guy was, but <laughs> that's not a fight you're ever going to win. Moving on to the next question. This is from Napalm Rat. Hello, Jingles. Recently had my 10-year anniversary of playing War Thunder. Wow, it's been out that long. Holy crap. He made the faithful, life-changing decision thanks to my... Ca oh, yeah, my Catalina video, where a bunch of us took a bunch of Catalinas up. Uh, actually, I did a couple of Catalina videos because that thing was just this most amazing low-level bomber. I mean, it, it should never have been, but it had loads of guns, and it had a low enough battle rating that the kind of aircraft, it was mostly biplanes and early monoplanes, and it didn't have much problems defending itself, and it could carry an absurd bomb load. So we used to have a lot of fun playing that thing. Uh, his question is, what are your greatest memories regarding War Thunder and the worst? What ultimately made you stop playing, and where's the difference to World of Warships and World of Tanks regarding that decision? So greatest memories regarding War Thunder. There's a lot of War Thunder questions today, isn't there? Maybe there's a trend. Um, well, things like that Catalina video, or those Catalina videos. And um, oh, I can remember, I was having one. I, I used to be actually pretty good in War Thunder, certainly the aircraft. And I can remember playing one battle. I can't remember what aircraft I was in. It was a biplane. I'd racked up 20 kills. And, and I was single-handedly trying to carry my team to victory. And at the end of it, there was just me against this one other guy. And unfortunately, he was quite easily the best player on the enemy team. And after racking up 20 kills, with only about three or four minutes of this battle left, he and I were just locked into this dogfight where neither of us could get the advantage uh, that went on for minutes, and it eventually ended with me getting shot down. So that was probably the best and worst <laughs> experience I ever had with War Thunder. 20 kills, just needed 21 to win, and it just wasn't enough. Um, what was it that made me stop playing War Thunder? You know, I can't remember the specific details, but it was something very sort of wargaming-like, the same kind of shit that wargaming were known for pulling. Um, again, I can't remember the specific details, but... They, oh, that was it. They were... Yeah, they were, they were, they were going a step further than even wargaming. Um, people who were criticising things that Gaijin were doing were getting their accounts banned and suspended and entire forum threads were being removed because Gaijin always had this very distinctly communist attitude to moderation um i think there may have been more to it again i can't remember the specific details but there was there was something to do with the way they were monetizing things and their attitude to the responses that people had to the way they were monetizing things um and you, you could you could write it off as an overly zealous moderation team but it was the actual ceo you know the president of the company that was stepping in and, and doing this shit 
uh, I've had a similar experience. Do you guys remember Fractured Space, Edge Case Games? My friend James Brooksby, the CEO, um, ended up getting bought out by Wargaming and is now Wargaming Guildford, working on something, don't know what. Um, but it, it's if you don't, you ne- put it this way, you never allow the CEO to go onto Twitter or Reddit in, and respond to criticisms of their game because the CEO doesn't have media relations training usually. And um, I remember when Fractured Space went live, James was, uh, you know, he was browsing Twitter and Reddit because he was, you know, keen to see how the game was being received. It was his, his, his baby, you know, it had just gone live. And uh, somebody had said something, some criticism that just basically wasn't true. And James thought, I'll, 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 I'll correct him. You know, he wasn't being nasty or anything. He was just, oh, this guy's got the wrong end of the stick. The poor naive fool. <laughs> he started engaging with haters on Reddit. And within 15 minutes, his media uh, manager came over and said, James, are you on Reddit? He says, yes. Step away from the keyboard now. <laughs> <laughs> he had to physically be restrained from talking to people like, oh, yeah, you, you never let, you have to have people whose job is community relations deal with the community. And in War Thunder's case, that, if that had been, you know, just some poorly trained uh, community moderators who were you know, the power had gone to their heads and whatever, then it could have been understandable, but it was the actual guy in charge of the company um, stirring up all this shit. And I, again, I can't remember the specific details of what what trick, what kicked it all off, but that, that kind of, that was it for me with War Thunder. Um, and at the time, I hadn't actually been playing War Thunder for a while, so it was an easy decision for me to make. But then, of course, they did kind of do a, a walk back about a year later. They, they stopped being quite as draconian, and that was about when I started getting back into doing War Thunder videos again. Anyway, moving on to the next question. This is from Slavic Boy. Hello, mighty overlord Jingles. In the past, you played Frostpunk, and I loved the video so much that I bought it. I love the game. Will we get a casual Saturday for Frostpunk 2? Oh, Frostpunk was such a good game. Um, that was... I mean, the main campaign, it didn't last that long, but holy shit, it was hard. Um, we, you know, when the temperatures really started plummeting, they're down to minus 40, um, and, and people are literally freezing alive, and the, the power's going off, and you need to get coal up from the mines to get the generators going, so volunteers, are, you, you know, you can force people to go in um, or, or ask for volunteers, and you know, the game, it was such a good game. Um, and the real sense of, because everything's going to shit around you and your decisions are crucial, they're life and death. And it was, it had this, this, this real sense of impending doom. Um, but everything about it, the graphics, the music, the voice acting, everything just came together to do this perfect storm of, oh shit, we're all going to die, we're all going to die, we're all going to die in the finale, the finale, crescendo, I can't think of the right word, you know, as the game built up to a conclusion. Amazingly good game. I have to admit to my eternal shame, I didn't even know there was a Frostpunk 2. So thank you for bringing that one to my attention, Slavic Boy. I will definitely look into that. Uh, if it's half as good as the first game, it will definitely be worth a video series. Oh, there's a whole bunch of questions here from <laughs> from uh, Yang Wen Li. How do you, Majestic Overlord Jingles? Happy Easter in advance to you and Rita. Now about my queries. One, what anime have you watched these past two months? Okay, I can answer that one. None. Um, oh, if none, may I suggest Legend of Galactic Heroes, Violet Evergarden, and 86. Yes, I'm back trying to convert you to our religion. Weebs! <laughs> uh, oh, oh, you've, I don't know if you've seen my figure collection. I, I have no space to criticise. Anyway, also, can we get an anime for Jingle's channel? I sincerely doubt it. Mandatory requirements for those would be what makes it great, level of sexualization, and short summary. Yeah, because that's basically my big turn off when it comes to anime. Um, because I love Girls and Panzer because it was, you know, superbly well animated tank battles. And the, the when, you know, when, the, when you weren't watching the tank battles, it was basically a slice of life style, bunch of girls in school video. And, and it was completely inoffensive. You know, there was, there was no fan service. There were no panty shots. 
You know, it was just because we're talking about high school girls here that they shouldn't be, for God's sake. What's wrong with you? Um, and people suggested, oh, if you like Girls in Panzer, you should watch, what was it, Strike Witches. It's basically Girls in Panzer, but with aircraft. And I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds good. I managed the first three minutes of Strike Witches um, because it, it, any opportunity they had to do a loving close-up of the girls' crotches uh, they took that opportunity, and it was, yeah, no, sorry, I don't care what the rest of it is like. It, it, over sexualization of young girls, which, let's face it, anime fans, is a thing, uh, is a real turn-off for me. So, yeah. Um, if you could suggest anything that doesn't involve any of that, then I, I might give it a look. Two, have you recently read comics, visual novels, or light novels? Bonus cookies if they're comics from outside the US. Um, not recently. There was a game that I did play, Sunrider Academy. I think there were a bunch of Sunrider games, and they weren't bad. I did kind of like them, but that was years ago. Question 2.5, are you recording? Yes, I am. Question 3, no, you haven't gotten rid of me. <laughs> did you find it ironic that you've created your YouTube channel to save replays of you playing World of Tanks, but now you don't even play World of Tanks anymore and haven't featured a wargaming replay of yours since forever? Yeah, I suppose it is kind of ironic. Um... And yes, you are abusing your early bird privileges. Yeah, you get in early, you get to ask the big questions. Anyway, nep nep, next question. First of all, yes, I'm recording. And yes, my recording software is recording everything. We have tested. Second of all, you've mentioned that you've played Valkyria Chronicles and posted videos on your channel, but I couldn't see any such series on your channel. When you finish your current weekly Saturday shenanigans, we'll pick up the game. Um, Valkyria Chronicles. It's an anime-inspired game. It's a sort of... Um, alternate version of world war one slash two where you control it's 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 kind of like XCOM would probably be the the best way to describe it for anybody who's never heard of it XCOM with tanks and infantry um and it's superbly well animated uh, and the character designs and all the tank designs are just amazing as well it's it's, it's, it's a very very good game um, VC4 will you pick up the game potentially VC4 up for us I'm not sure I get the reference there but if you, if you, if you like that sort of thing um, and you don't object to anime I can definitely recommend Valkyria Chronicles I think they actually introduced some of the Valkyria Chronicles tanks into World of Tanks possibly the mobile version World of Tanks Blitz um, but yeah very very good game Next question comes from Mantra. Greetings, Jingles, from a cloudy Romania. Yeah, the weather's not particularly great over here either, Mantra. Any chance you can make a list with book recommendations on the topic of interesting naval battles or events? Many thanks. Ah, I don't see why not. I mean, you can just always read anything by James D. Hornfisher, the late, great James D. Hornfisher, unfortunately died two years ago. Um, Neptune's Inferno, The Fleet at Flood Tide, any of his books are amazing. Uh, what impressed me the most about James and his books. Uh, what was the first one I read? Neptune's Inferno, the six-month-long naval battle of Guadalcanal, was in the in the foreword. Remember, this guy has, may have never even spent a day at sea in his life. He certainly never served. Uh, he was a literary agent and a writer. And when you read his his foreword to Neptune's Inferno, when he talks about the nature of war at sea and what it means to be a sailor in a war at sea for a guy who has never served in a navy a day in his life he got it it was it was i was immediately impressed with this he just understands don't know how but he does and that hooked me, and I've read every one of his books ever since. So if you want a list, start with anything written by James D. Hornfisher. How are we doing for time? Oh, only 20 minutes in. No problem. Next question. Arlen Clay. Lord Jingles, Overlord of the Minds, Rear Admiral of our hearts. I love these titles. <laughs> <laughs> Given your job in a previous life was working aboard a Royal Navy warship, if you had the chance, would you do it over again, or would you go down a different path? My brother was unfortunately medically discharged from the Royal Navy after an incident in India. He would have loved to have kept serving on board his ship, HMS Illustrious, for as long as he could. Uh, I would absolutely do it again. It was fantastic. Um, I 
joined the Navy in 1989. Uh, and I never really had any plan to join the Navy. It wasn't like, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be a sailor or anything like that. It's just that I was desperate to get away from my parents. Uh, and the local newspaper was featuring adverts for radio operators in the Royal Navy. Now, idiot that I was at the time, I never stopped to ask myself the question, why are they so desperate to recruit radio operators? What's so bad about that job? <laughs> <laughs> that people are leaving in such numbers that they need to recruit that specific trade. So, yeah. Um, and to be fair, Radio Freighter wasn't that bad. Um, there were certainly worse jobs, but I was never very good at it. So I lasted about four years, and then I branch transferred to the writer branch, which I was very good at and loved, and served out the remainder of my 22-year uh, engagement as. Um, the only different choice that I would make would be I wouldn't join up as a radio operator I would join up as a writer and get it right the first time um, sorry to hear about your brother getting medically discharged I almost got medically discharged from the Navy actually it was in my last oh, let me see I was working at Fort Blockhouse which is the joint service medical training facility in Gosport so probably in my last four years um, and I had a problem with shin splints um which made it very painful to run. And there's this thing called the medical border survey, where if you have a long-term medical condition, um, you get sent to the medical border survey, which is, uh, it's all very official. You're there in a born uniform, you're standing in front of, um, they're all medical officers, one captain, one commander, and a lieutenant. And they ask you about your condition they've obviously got your medical history in front of them and um, and there and then they will make a ruling as to whether or not you can stay in the navy and if they say you have to be medically discharged you are gone the same day mostly for insurance purposes you know if you're not insured to be on board a naval base they get you off the naval base but you are literally discharged that same afternoon um i was there with one other guy and he was a young fella. He'd only been in a couple of years, and I don't know what was wrong with him, but it was in the locker room afterwards, and he was in tears. Was his, his, his career was over. Done. Like that. You're out. Failed your medical board. Uh, I was fortunate to be retained in what they called a reduced medical category, because the problem with my leg, basically my legs were are, are screwed from the knees down. Um, uh, shin splints is a, is a condition that you normally associate with people like footballers and it can be career ending for a footballer if you can't run without pain you're no good to a football team <coughs> excuse me but I made the argument that it wasn't that I couldn't run it's just I couldn't run without pain and I'm in the navy how far am I realistically going to ever have to run I mean a ship's only so big and if I'm on the forecastle as the duty first aider and there's a medical emergency on the other end of the ship on the quarter deck. I'll run to the quarter deck. I'll, I only have to put up with a pain for a minute because that's as long as it takes for me to get from one end of the ship to the other. And they said, actually, you make a very good point. And of course, it didn't hurt that um, the captain of the medical board, uh, Captain Neil McLove, uh, I did his pay. <laughs> Um, because my job at Fort Blockhouse, amongst other things, was looking after the pay of all the people that worked at the Institute of Naval Medicine, which is where the medical board was conducted. And when he joined and took over from the previous captain, um, he had a bit of a pay issue where he hadn't been correctly paid on being promoted to captain, and he was owed a whole bunch of back pay. And it took me a good three months to sort all of this out for him, various um, consultations going forth between me and the pay authority, but I eventually got it. And, uh, and he ended up getting an awful lot of money, thanks to me. So uh, it was nice. <laughs> How can I put it? He had my back from the second I stood in front of him at the medical board. So I was retained in a reduced medical category, which was great because it just meant that I didn't have to do the, annual, uh, the, the fitness test every year. So, hey. <laughs> so I did my last four years without having to do any PT. Uh, great result. Anyway, um, <laughs> moving on. Um, there's a lot more anime requests here, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep moving on. Takatsuru says, "Just want to say hi." Jingles kept forgetting about this Q and A. Yeah, yeah, it's I nearly forgot about it. Actually, me and Grumps both nearly forgot about it. <laughs> so it just happened today. I was on Discord with my cousin playing a video to game together, and this popped up. Yeah, I made notification about half an hour before, 
because if I forgot about it, I'm pretty sure a lot of other people did too. Um, Gosshawk says, my greetings to the salt mine overlord from the northern and icy parts of the mine. Oh, Frostpunk references there. To the question, do you have any plans to travel this upcoming summer? If so, where? Um, I don't have any specific plans, but my friend Roy, uh, that I did the Hell's Highway tour with um, in the Netherlands a couple of years ago, we're both determined to get something done. We're not sure what yet, but we, we, we definitely want to go for a road trip somewhere. So any suggestions would be welcome because we're quite kind of stumped. We're thinking Normandy, you know, do a tour of the beaches and so on and so on. Pegasus Bridge, that sort of thing. Um, but we're, we're absolutely 100% open to suggestions. Next question. Where are we? Okay, it's nep, nep This better not be an anime question, nep, nep for my third and final question of the morning. I recall sharing my recipe for pumpkin bread with you over the Discord. You may have to convert the units of measurement to whatever standard you Brits use, but could we see you making it on your home with a gnome channel and getting yours and Rita's reaction to it? Oh, and VC4 apparently is Valkyria Chronicles 4. Thank you for that edit. I can't stand pumpkin, although Rita likes it. And we do have a whole bunch of cans of pumpkin. I know, don't did they? I didn't buy them, Rita did. Um, because she was using it as a food supplement for crystalline before she died. So we've got a whole bunch of pumpkin, and I don't know if it's, if I mean, I don't suppose it would make any difference, because the flesh of a pumpkin is kind of, you know, cannibal. Um, but I, here's the issue, I don't like pumpkin. Something about the flavour, I just, bleh. Um Although Rita, certainly, I, mean, I might suggest it to Rita, see if she can make some pumpkin bread out of it, because we've got this, all these cans of pumpkin that we don't really have any use for anymore. So maybe, maybe we could do that. Kylo says, when you become all-powerful imperial ruler of the world, I, I like that you said when and not if, what's the first law that you'll implement? Um, well, I am a gnome overlord, and uh, the campaign for equal heights will be in full, full force. We will get bar counters lowered, <laughs> and uh, doorknobs will be lowered at least two feet, and uh, we'll have to do something about squirrels. Squirrels are dangerous creatures when you're three feet tall. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> anyway, the Make-A-Woosh Foundation. Hi, Jingles. Hi, Cats. Hi, Chat. Sing a song for me, Mighty Gnome Overlord, for I have reached level 40 today. No, wait, don't sing instead. Oh, congratulations. Happy birthday. Since we've just survived another April's Fools, the Navy also knows its pranks and traditions, right? Please share. What were the most entertaining practical jokes and baptisms? And what are the most despicable? Oh, how long do we have? Half an hour-ish. <laughs> Anybody who posted a question after Make-A-Wish Foundation, there's a very, very slim chance I might get around to it because the kind of gags and pranks that we pulled on each other in the Navy. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. Where do I start? There's, um, I'm trying to remember the ones that I fell for. Or the ones that we just pulled on everybody. So there's all kinds of stuff that you do. Um, some of them official, some of them unofficial. For example, um, there's, there's all the old ones, like you send somebody to the, uh, to the buffer store to get a left-handed screwdriver. Um, and you'd be amazed at the number of people that fall for that one. Then when somebody new joins the ship, fresh out of training, the, the boots that we used on board ships, they're called uh, DMS boots, stands for Direct Molded Sole. Um, because they're insulated, so you know you won't get electrocuted, and blah blah blah, and so on and so on. But nobody calls them DMS boots. Everybody calls them steaming bats. Don't ask. <laughs> oh, I probably have to explain. So bats is just navy nickname for boots, um, and steaming is they were the boots that you wore when the ship was steaming, so cruising, back from when they were steamships. And the name just stuck. So your, your boots, DMS, were known as steam and bats. And whenever somebody new joined the ship, at some point in the first couple of days, you can guarantee they would get sent up to the main galley to get their steam and bats steamed. And the chefs would get so sick of it. <laughs> Every time a bunch of new people joined the ship. Um, but it was just you know another one of the things that they did. Then they would, they would have official gags. Um, like the splash target coxswain. So a splash target is 
a target. It's a it's a it's a floating target that would get towed behind the ship uh, for gunnery training. Hence the term splash target. And if he was feeling particularly mischievous, the executive officer, right, second in command of the ship, would publish an executive officer's temporary memorandum or an XTM, asking for volunteers to be splash target coxswains. So a coxswain's the guy that steers. And the idea would be that they would ask for volunteers to sit on the splash target and steer it while they were conducting gunnery training on the splash target. You would not believe the number of idiots <laughs> who would volunteer for this because you got paid for it. Well, you didn't. It's a joke. But in the XTM, the executive officer would be asking for volunteers to do splash target coxswain and receive £10 an hour while they were doing it. So all of these idiots who volunteered to sit on a target that was getting shot at, <laughs> you'd get them all on the quarter deck, the back end of the ship, under the flight deck, for splash target coxswain training, where they would all be wearing waterproofs and life jackets and you'd, every other spare piece of useless kit that you could pile onto them. And then you'd turn the hose onto them. <laughs> and don't forget, firefighting hoses on board a warship, three-inch hoses, right? There's some pressure coming out of those. It takes two people to fire one of these things up without going for flying lessons in order to hold the hose down. And you'd blast them with these hoses while they all started shouting out, five degrees to port, five degrees to starboard. <laughs> Doing their splash target cocks and training. Then... <laughs> There were all kinds of stuff like this. And these were just the semi-official ones. And I should probably get on to the next question. Or I'll be here all day. But the, the kind of shit that we would pull. And the, the, the dumb shit that people would fall for. Bunk light bill. There's another one. Yeah. Um, the, the, the bunk beds that you slept in down the mess deck. They would have a little air vent and a little light. It was known as the bunk light. And when somebody joined the ship for the first time. At the end of the month. Um, in each mess deck, they would uh, they would collect mess fees. So, for example, your beer bill would have to be paid, and your laundry bill would have to be paid. But then they would ask for your bunk light bill for the electricity that you use. <laughs> the bunk light. The people actually thought they were getting charged for the electricity they use when they were in their bed at night. Oh, the, the amount of shit people would fall for is unbelievable. Um, the one thing that I fell for which kind of backfired on the person. And I know I said I would move on to the next question, but I'm having fun here. Um, so obviously flags are a big thing in the Navy. Um, you've got the, the white ensign. And when you're alongside the, the ensign, there's a, there's a staff right at the front of the folks, right at the pointiest bit of the pointiest end of the ship. It's called the ensign staff. And uh, colours in the morning, you raise the ensign on the ensign staff and you raise the union jack on the jack staff at the back end of the ship at the arse end on the flight deck and it's a big ceremony it has to be done every day and then in the evening you do the ceremony of sunset which doesn't necessarily happen at sunset um at the very latest it'll happen at 8 p.m but if sunset actually occurs prior to 8 p.m so it depends on what time of the year it is then sunset is done at the moment of sunset and again it's a big ceremony when you're on a ship alongside when you're at sea um you, the, you, you don't have the ensign at the front of the ship and, and you don't have the jack, uh, the Union Jack at the back end of the ship. Instead, you have uh, a battle ensign, big, big ensign that's flown from the mainmast and you just leave it up. Right? You don't, you don't, it doesn't go up every morning. It doesn't come down every night. You just leave it up. So on my first ship as a radio operator, um, and radio operators, we didn't just operate radios. Right? We, we took charge of all signals so any flag hoists flashing lights any, any of that stuff that was our responsibility and it was also our responsibility to do colors in the morning and sunset in the evening so the very first time i sailed on my very first ship hms brazen we're at sea as soon as we sailed the ensign came down from the ensign staff the jack came down from the jack staff and the battle ensign went up on the mainmast and then that night at sea my first night at sea my uh, leading radio operator in the communications office thought we'll, 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 get, we'll get him on, a one, on an easy here. And he looked up at the Zulu clock. He said, oh my God, we've missed sunset. 
get your ass down to the uh, to the uh, uh, flight deck and quickly, you know, get the flag down before the officer of the watch notices. And I was like, oh shit. So I ran down to the flight deck. And meanwhile, they're in the off. They're all in the office going, ha ha, idiot. <laughs> so I ran down <laughs> to the flight deck. And of course, there's no flag there because we're at sea. But I didn't realize. So they're all laughing their asses off. And five minutes later, I come back into the communications office with this big ass white ensign in my hands. <laughs> like, where the fuck did you get that? So, well, I ran down to the flight deck and there was no flag there. But on the way back up to the office, Coming up the starboard waist, I looked up and I saw this ensign flying from the mainmast. So I pulled that one down instead. <laughs> get it back up. <laughs> Quick, get it back up, you idiots. They blamed me. <laughs> they sent me to pull the flag down. I pulled the flag down. What's the problem? But that's, 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 that's the biggest one I ever fell for. And it totally backfired on the people who pulled it. Anyway, moving on. We will finally get off this question. I can't wait to see the reactions to that one in the comments. Um, <laughs> uh, this is from Magister. Now that you're trying to get back into modelling, have you considered making a model of HMS Newcastle or any other ships that you've served on? I, I actually have a model kit of uh, the GWS-30 Sea Dart launcher that was fitted on HMS Newcastle. So that big twin Sea Dart launcher. Uh, I don't know if you know what it looks like. Um, and it's a decent sized kit. It actually comes, I think it was from TACOM. It also comes with a Seawolf launcher, the old Seawolf launcher from the early Type 22 frigates. Um, and I, I do plan to get that done. Actually, I can remember, um, where were we? It's my very first deployment. First Gulf War, or right before the first Gulf War kicked off. We were in Qatar, in Oman. And we're parked up on the jetty. And I can remember there were a couple, I don't know if they were tourists or anything, but two Americans. Um, and the jetty was right in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't like we were, a, a, you know, a tourist destination or anything, but a couple of Americans were there just looking at the ship, and that's fine, you know, it's, it's not a problem. And they were looking up at the Seawolf launcher, which is a, it's a launcher with two missiles on it. And I was walking past, I was going ashore, and I overheard them saying, well, that doesn't look like a very well-armed ship, it only has two missiles. And I could have stopped to tell them that, yeah, there are two missiles loaded, but when it fires those two missiles off, another two missiles pop up from the magazine underneath it. Um, but I just couldn't be bothered, and I kept going. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I, that's a story. I, I mean, it's not much of a story, but uh, it's deceptive, because, I mean, you, you know, you look at the Seawolf launcher, you can see the six pods where the missiles are stored, and you think, okay, six missiles, and then there's another six at the, at the rear, so that's 12 missiles. It's a decent armament. But you look at Sea Dart, and you can only see two missiles. You think, ah, oh, that's a bit shit. But, um, yeah, the launchers pop. Uh, vertical to connect to the rails leading down to the magazine underneath the launcher where there's I probably can't say exactly how many missiles but a lot more than two let's just put it that way Agent of Sintria says who's your favourite fictional detective and why ah right this is an easy one I just can't remember his name <laughs> Harry something um, there's a series of novels oh I'm really bad here a series of novels written by somebody whose name I can't remember, regarding a fictional detective whose first name is the only thing I can remember. Harry Dresden. That was it. And uh, he's a wizard. And he's listed in the phone book as a wizard detective. Um, and he doesn't care who knows he's a wizard, even though most people don't believe it. Um, and the books are incredible. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. The Dresden Chronicles, um, where they, they treat magic seriously. It's like a sort of grown-up version of Harry Potter, um, where magic is real. Most people don't believe it exists. Um, but, you know, elves are real, vampires are real, demons are real. Um, but they're all in this sort of underworld in society. And uh, Harry Dresden, consulting wizard detective, takes on these various cases. It, it's, they're, ju they're just so good. The, the whole, every character in the books is amazing. Uh, I could go on for hours about the Harry Dresden novels, and I still can't remember who wrote them, but I'm sure that somebody is typing it into the question channel right now who's also read the Harry Dresden books and is desperate to have other people enjoy them as much as they do and is uh, is coming up with a name. I'll try and remember, and, and um, when, when this goes out on Mingles with Jingles as a video, I'll put the name of the, of the author up when I remember it. But yeah, the, easily my favourite fictional detective. <laughs> Ray or Asuka? This question from Moose. 
What's with all the weebs today? <laughs> Ray or Asuka? I... I'm assuming... Oh, wait a minute. I mentioned earlier Sunrider Academy. I think these are two characters from Sunrider. So, who would you ship? Ray or Asuka? Honestly, I think I'm going... I can barely remember what the characters were like, but for some reason, Asuka is... He's getting my vote. Can't remember exactly why. Next question from Catster. We're going to have to start wrapping this up. We're 40 minutes in. Why did you start YouTube in the first place? Okay. Uh, this is a question that pops up. Not that often, but obviously, you know, there are a lot of new people around and maybe they haven't heard the answer to this one. So originally, uh, I, I got into YouTube basically by accident. Uh, a very lucky accident. Um, I was playing World of Tanks. And obviously, World of Tanks has the replay system. And there were various third-party websites that could host your replays. So if you had a really, really good game and you wanted to save it, you could upload the replay to one of these third-party websites. And I had a whole bunch of... Well, I mean, I was a bit of a noob in World of Tanks at the time, but, you know, even a noob can have a good game every now and then. Even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day. And when I had these good games, I would upload the replays. But because these were third-party websites, right, basically run by amateurs, uh, enthusiasts, it, when you set one of these things up at first, it's cheap because, you know, you're not paying for huge amounts of bandwidth because you've just set the whole place up and nobody knows about it. But they kind of suffered from their own popularity where you would get one of these hosting websites that was doing really well and a lot, a lot of people were using it but then the guy running it couldn't afford to pay for the bandwidth anymore so the whole thing would collapse and you'd lose all of those replays and this happened a couple of times this was before there was whatreplays.com which is officially supported by wargaming so it's not going anywhere but this was long before that so i thought i was getting sick and tired of losing all these replays so i thought well youtube doesn't seem to be going anywhere fast it's probably going to be around for a while so instead of just uploading a replay file i would record video of the battle and put it onto YouTube and then people started watching them so I thought well, I'll put some commentary on and then more people started watching them and well the rest is history but yeah I, I never got into YouTube because I wanted to be a YouTuber I got into YouTube as a way of saving my best world of tanks balance yeah. uh, next question from gravity Falls 618 Good morning, Jingles. Hope you're well. I wanted to ask, how did you get introduced to Girls and Panzer? Who's your favourite character from the show? I can't... I honestly can't remember how I got into Girls and Panzer. Um, I don't know if it was recommended to me by somebody. Because that's the thing about weebs, right? You want everybody else to be a weeb as well. <laughs> so <laughs> It was probably recommended to me by somebody who saw my YouTube channel and realised how much I love tanks and said, here's something you might like. That's almost certainly the way it happened. Um, and my favourite character from the show? I'm having a bit of a brain fog here, I am. <coughs> I can't remember her name. She's the loader, the one with the, um, the brown hair. Because that's how you differentiate between anime characters, isn't it? What colour hair do they have? <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I can't remember the character's name. I'm, like I said, I'm having a bit of a brain fog, but I absolutely loved her. She certainly wasn't the most attractive member of the tank crew, but she was such a massive tank nerd. I mean, she was so obviously into tanks. She, she, they, they even had a, in one episode, they went around to her place and they watched Kelly's Heroes because she was that into tanks. And her hero was Oddball, the tank commander, played by Donald Sutherland. Um, Yukari, thank you, Gravity Falls. Yukari is the character I'm thinking of. He's just edited this question. Yeah, she's amazing. I think she's fantastic. Uh, she's definitely my favourite character from the show. Um, next question, and I think we're probably going to have to start wrapping things up because we're coming up to nearly an hour now. Baron Sable, howdy jingles, I have no idea why I'm still awake, but since I'm somehow able to type, have you looked into the console version of World of Warships ever? I mean, have you watched gameplay and looked at the differences between it and the PC version? I did, when I first got my PS4, uh, which, and the only reason I got the PS4 was to play Red Dead Redemption 2, but it was at the same time as... Uh, the console version of World of Warships came out and I did play it um, and it is different uh, because of the nature of the gameplay on a console I mean obviously they've compressed the tiers it doesn't go up to tier 10 I think at the time it went to tier 7 and you had ships like the Iowa um, which were top tier 
so they compressed the tears a bit. Uh, but it played pretty well. It was it was totally playable with a with a PlayStation controller, and they did something very different with their commanders as well, um, which I think was better than what they did with the PC version of World of Warships. But I never carried on playing it because I have World of Warships on the PC, uh, and I was playing that. And why do I need to play another version of World of Warships? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't. I wouldn't. I'll, uh, this was years ago, so I hadn't really kept up with the development of the console version because I said, well, there's no point in me playing the console version because I've got the PC version and I've got a lot of stuff invested in the PC version. I've got a load of ships. I mean, why would I want to do all that again? So I stopped really following the development of the console version. I couldn't really say whether it's better or worse because, like I said, I've stopped following the development of the console version. Um, better, worse, don't know, different, definitely. Um, there are things that just work better on a console than they do on a PC and vice versa, so they're never going to be exactly the same game. And they never were from the start, uh, which is fine. But, um, yeah, I can't really ever see myself going back to the console version, mostly because I have unpacked, unplugged and uh, stowed my PlayStation 4. <laughs> I don't even use, I don't even have it plugged in anymore. It was just sitting there using power on standby. And power isn't cheap these days. The only thing I ended up, once I'd finished Red Dead Redemption 2, the only thing I really ever used the PlayStation 4 for uh, was as a media player. So, because you could you could access Amazon Prime and Netflix and what have you through it. So I would have that on the big TV um, and watch TV on it, basically. But now I've got, you know, a TV with all that built in, so I never really needed the PlayStation anymore. So it's now in storage. Uh, so, yeah, zero chance of me ever going back to World of Warships um, What's it called? Legends. That's it. I keep saying World of Warships console. I know it's got an actual title. World of Warships Legends. Yeah, it wasn't bad, and it was pretty enjoyable, um, but I haven't kept up with the development, and since I had so much time invested in World of Warships PC, there wasn't a lot of point in me continuing to play on the console. And um, I think that's where we're going to have to wrap things up here, because we're coming up to an hour-ish, and, and I could stay here answering questions all day, but I'd be here answering questions all day, so... Uh, thank you to everybody who turned up. Thanks again to Grumps for organising this thing. We both almost forgot. Because <laughs> we're both old and we're both crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, not, not getting any younger. No, that's, that's right. Wrong. Grumps that's is, wrong. however, just slightly less crap than I am. He remembered before I did. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all for turning up. Thanks to Grubs for organising it, and uh, I hope you're not too disappointed if you didn't have any of your questions answered. But that's it for today. And if you're listening to this as your episode of Mingsburg Jingles on Monday, take care, and I'll catch you next time.